And uh, you know, uh, I do want to welcome you to this uh, last social science education lecture of the 15-16 uh, season. And uh, rest assured, we will have a season next year also. Uh, but um, this has been a um, uh, successful, really good season. And it will end on a high note here with uh, our own Dwight Farrow, who's going to talk. And uh, just to make sure that you know who I am, uh, I am chair of the series. Uh, I'm, and my name is Nina Rosenstein, and I'm professor of philosophy here. I've been uh, chairing the series for over 10 years. Now it is my uh, it great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, professor of philosophy here at Mesa, Dwight Furrow. And uh, he is a prolific writer. And it, this talk is partly in celebration of his new book that just came out. And it is American Foodie, Taste, Art, and the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and in addition to that, he has written numerous books, uh, uh, in, uh, among them, uh, Reviving the Left, uh, the, need, uh, for, um, the Need to Restore Liberal Values in America, and Ethics, a Key Concept, which is a textbook, and Moral Soundings, and other, uh, and other writings also. Uh, and he's also a frequent blogger, I should say. Uh, and in addition to that, he's a certified wine expert by the Society for uh, Wine Education of uh, California? No, it's nationwide. Nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I introduce Dwight Furrow and his talk, right, because we don't have a, uh, an overhead thing now. The title is Why the Philosophy of Food is Important. Thank you for uh, coming out on a Friday afternoon. Um, so the philosophy of food, why is it important? Uh, you're probably surprised that there is such a thing as the philosophy of food. Uh, <laughs> and even some philosophers are surprised, <laughs> surprised by that. Um, so there are lots of hard problems um, that require our thoughtful attention. Um, poverty, inequality, climate change, uh, quantum entanglement, if you're so inclined, um, or how to make a living, uh, just for starters. Um, but food, worthy of thought. Uh, most philosophers have ignored food uh, as a proper topic of philosophical inquiry. Um, there actually has, uh, Plato had a few things to say about food. He wasn't a big fan. Um, and um, he certainly didn't make it uh, part of his, you know, his formal theory at all. Um, in the 18th century, Kant and Hume talked about taste a bit as a kind of precursor to their debate about the nature of art. Um, Nietzsche, a 19th century philosopher, had a few things to say about food as well, usually um, about health and so on. Um, so not much discussion uh, in the history of philosophy uh, about food at all. And on the surface, there, there seems to be good reasons why philosophers don't talk much about food. Uh, it seems like there's only three questions uh, about food worth considering. One, do you have enough? Two, is it nutritious? And three, does it taste good? Okay. I'm assuming, uh, since you're here today, uh, you probably have enough to eat. Um, and uh, as far as food being nutritious, you can consult your doctor or favorite nutritionist uh, for that information. Uh, and you certainly don't need uh, thought to tell you whether food tastes good or not. Uh, so it looks like there really isn't anything here for philosophy to be concerned with. Um, but when we look at more deeply uh, at food, we find some important issues that are lurking just beneath the surface uh, about which philosophy sometimes has been concerned, uh, how we farm, uh, what we eat, um, and um, you know, how we produce food, uh, how we cook, and so on. These have important social, political, and ethical ramifications. And I would argue that these ramifications are so important that today we cannot think of these issues as purely private matters any longer. Um, in fact, some of the aforementioned hard problems uh, have a lot to do with food. Uh, our food distribution uh, networks are anything but fair, uh, leaving many people without enough to eat. Uh, our food production and consumption patterns uh, cause substantial environmental harm, uh, in part because of their impact on climate change. Um, a resource-intensive way of eating, uh, supported by an economic system that requires constant growth, uh, is unsustainable, uh, especially 
uh, because uh, the rest of the world would like to emulate it. Uh, for example, it's estimated that if everyone in the world consumed our meat-heavy diet, we would need two planet Earths to supply sufficient land, feed, and water. Food is our most basic material need, uh, and it ties together a vast number of issues, from deforestation to resource depletion to the use of fossil fuels, uh, environmental contamination, to the disappearance of local food markets, to questions about the ethical treatment of animals. So we, we could surely raise legitimate philosophical questions about food production and consumption that fall into contemporary philosophical categories like environmental ethics, applied ethics, and political philosophy. And today there is more and more discussion within these categories of issues related to food. So it's no longer quite true that philosophers ignore food entirely, but it is still very much a minor topic uh, within philosophy. Uh, but the significance of the philosophy of food, I want to argue, does not wholly rest on it becoming a branch of applied ethics uh, or social theory, uh, a collection of topics for professional philosophers uh, to consider. Uh, these looming environmental and sustainability problems that I just referred to entail that we must learn to live differently. And that means fundamentally learning to desire differently, and especially learning to desire food differently because of the impact of food production and consumption on uh, natural resources and social systems. So all of the aforementioned social and political issues are tied to how we manage our desires for food. And desire management, it turns out, uh, does have a long philosophical history, although most of it is a very ancient history. The question of how we refine desires and pleasures and attend to their moderation, balance, and harmony uh, was a central philosophical topic for the ancient Greeks and Romans. Although Plato did not have much to say about food, he did have a lot to say about how desires can be controlled. Theories that were elaborated on and in some ways significantly revised by his student Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, of course, argued that desires should uh, be regulated by the virtues which require moderation in order to become habits directed toward leading a good uh, human life. Following the lead of the ancient Greek philosophers, the various schools of Hellenistic and Roman philosophy that came after Stoicism, Epicureanism, Neoplatonism, uh, also were fundamentally concerned with the regulation of desire. All these schools of thought regarded philosophy as the mechanism through which we accomplished that regulation of desire. This was an important issue for ancient philosophers because they believed that philosophy was not just a theoretical inquiry um, into the nature of reality. They believed that only through the disciplined study of nature and human nature and the modification of our desires to conform to those truths uncovered by that inquiry, could anyone lead a good human life? I mean, for those early philosophers, philosophy was necessary to lead a good life. The primary goal of philosophy, though, was self-transformation, motivated by and in accordance with reason, aimed at leading a good, uh, good life. For better or worse, uh, philosophy in subsequent centuries has drifted away from those ancient concerns. We no longer think of philosophy today as a way of modifying desires. Why this is the case is a long and very complex story. Uh, part of the historical story has to do with the influence of Christianity, uh, but there are also conceptual difficulties as well. Uh, it's questionable whether reason by itself can motivate action. That is something all the ancients believed, but that would be rejected by many, many contemporary philosophers. But perhaps more importantly, the question of how to live has come to be seen as a subjective matter, except when the ethical treatment of others is at stake. And so philosophy on this more modern view should be seen as more like a science concerned with what can be objectively determined even in the ethical sphere. The modern assumption is that questions about how to live should be left up to individuals to decide because these are questions that reason by itself cannot answer. Happily, uh, some philosophers, inspired in part by the ancients, but also by the later work of um, a French philosopher by the name of Michel Foucault on technologies of the self, and John Dewey's uh, pragmatism. John Dewey was an early uh, 20th century American philosopher. 
Uh, some philosophers today are beginning to revive some of these ancient concerns about the management uh, of desires. Uh, and it's, I think it's worth summarizing uh, Foucault's work, especially because it has a direct bearing on why the philosophy of food should receive more attention today. Uh, Foucault did not talk about food, uh, but I think his, his uh, approach to philosophy has a lot to, to tell us about how we should think uh, about food. Uh, Foucault uh, famously argued that modern societies regulate their inhabitants through techniques that subjugate bodies and control populations. Through disciplining individuals via institutions like schools and prisons and economic markets, and by disciplining populations via the imposition of statistical measures, the introduction of economic incentives, and the establishment of norms that constitute health, and so on. I mean, all these are topics that Foucault talked about. Modern societies control their populations, not by means of force, primarily, but through discourses that seek truth and by getting individuals to internalize and thus willingly impose these norms on themselves. Uh, in sum, Foucault argued that modern individuals are caught up in a web of socialization processes around which we form our identities, with a clear implication that these socialization processes inhibit individual autonomy. You might think of this as a kind of soft uh, totalitarianism on Foucault's view doesn't require explicit force because we internalize these norms and impose them on ourselves. In the uh, latter part of his career, uh, Foucault turns to questions about how, as individuals, we might free ourselves from these social norms. Uh, and he conceptualizes a project which he calls Care of the Self uh, that is inspired by his reading of Greek and Roman philosophy and its cultural context as well, because he was as much a historian as he was a philosopher. Uh, care of the self involves two components on his view. The first is the negative aim of breaking loose from the self, which as I said is merely the result of these subjugating social forces, by acknowledging the various ways in which society seeks to imprison people by imposing identities on them. So that's the first uh, part of the care, care of the self. The second then is an affirmative aim of constituting on a personal and interpersonal level an ethic of the self designed to be a point of resistance to what he calls disciplinary power. So we kind of separate ourselves from these social norms and then try to reconstruct the self by um, um, uh, adopting norms that resist what he calls disciplinary power. Now, according to Foucault, care of the self, then, is not about self-discovery, but it's about self-creation. It's not a turn inward, but a modified relationship to what is exterior to us, to the web of social practices that constitute the self. This reflective self, then, is the raw material to be shaped by self-imposed rules of conduct, which he says give style to one's life. Like the views of the ancient philosophers, the goal of the care of the self is not theory, but the transformation of the individual by examining one's conscience, critically checking representations which appear in the mind, and importantly, developing practices that bring one's desires into conformity with the results of that inquiry. But unlike the ancients, for Foucault, the means of the self-transformation is not reason alone, since we no longer think the aim of human conduct is conformity to nature. Rather, self-transformation involves giving style to one's character and one's life, making your style and character your own. Now, that discourse about managing desires, which was central to ancient Greek and Roman philosophy and that inspired Foucault, has never been more important than it is today. And our food desires must now lie at the center of that discourse. We must find new ways of desiring and conceptualizing how to live. And given our historical concern with these matters, philosophy, I think, has a central role to play. However, the modern view of human beings as abstract epistemological subjects, abstract knowers, in other words, may lack the conceptual apparatus to think about the realm of contingent bodily needs like food. So philosophy may have to reinvent itself to deal with these issues or to think critically about food. However, there is a traditional philosophical discourse that I think can be helpful 
uh, in thinking about food, and that, of course, is aesthetics, the study of beauty and sensory experience in general. Uh, the emergence of a genuine food culture in the English-speaking world over the last few decades provides plenty of fodder for considering food as an art form. In the hands of the great chefs today, food has the meaning and emotional resonance uh, that we typically associate with art. Uh, many philosophers uh, today resist this move to view food as an art form. Uh, I would like to tell you that their arguments have all been soundly defeated by the arguments in my book. Uh, <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, um, we can talk more about that in the discussion if you want this notion of food as art. Uh, but I do think it's a promising area of exploration to apply traditional con uh, aesthetic concepts to food preparations. The question is, why do these arguments about food as art matter in the context of this discussion of the management of desires? Because I want to see these as uh, linked discourses. The environmental and sustainability issues I dis discussed earlier, to the extent they have philosophical import, are moral and political issues. Uh, notice that I've now switched to talking about aesthetic questions. In fact, Foucault talks about style as the aim of the care of the self. And style, of course, is an aesthetic notion as well. So that raises the question, how are ethics and aesthetics related? Uh, I think they're related in the following way. Um, we, all of us today, uh, live in remarkable times, uh, unique in the history of the human race. Because throughout most of history, uh, we face conditions of scarcity. Most people had to struggle to get enough to eat um, and to find shelter. Hard work was a constant necessity. Our problem today is not scarcity. It's overproduction. We simply produce too much. And all of our norms, the Protestant ethic, our fascination with entrepreneurship, the worship of business people as moral exemplars, or the working class as the salt of the earth, depending on what your perspective is, uh, all encourage more and more and more production. If we are to live sustainably, we probably have to learn to produce less and be satisfied with that. And that requires a fundamental reshaping of our norms and a fundamental transformation of our desires. So how do we accomplish that? I would suggest that an aesthetics of taste is fundamental to that project. After all, if we must learn to manage our desires differently, we will likely accomplish that only through modifying the personal aesthetic judgments on which those desires rest. Despite our sophisticated accounts of psychology, it remains a fundamental fact about human beings that the pursuit of pleasure is fundamental to human motivation. Uh, this is not a hedonistic view. Uh, pleasure is not the ultimate aim of all of our activity, but it is the reinforcer of our actions. It motivates us to perform an action again if it brings pleasure. That's an incentive to do it again and again. Uh, so it really, the pursuit of pleasure is at the bottom of the causal mechanisms that um, constitute human agency. Unless we're forced by circumstances, we are unlikely to change our habits unless the pursuit of pleasure is served. Wearing the hair shirt is probably not a prescription for social change, especially in a world already obsessed with the pursuit of pleasure. The solution to our sustainability uh, issues, then, is to substitute quantity with quality to substitute explosive pleasures that come from competition and violence with the subtler, gentler pleasures, of course, of which food is one, to substitute resource-dependent pleasure with more simple yet refined pleasure. All of that requires a modification of our aesthetic point of view. No doubt, ethical concepts are distinct from aesthetic concepts. But in the implementation of our conceptual framework, I think they, uh, the aesthetic and the ethical are joined. And I think that the aesthetic discourse is more fundamental. Shaping norms means shaping desires. And that means shaping how we experience pleasure. And that means we must be concerned with aesthetics, fundamentally. The aesthetics of taste is especially important to us because I don't think one can live well in our world 
without taking an interest in the aesthetics of everyday life. And because the enjoyment of food and beverage is among the most accessible and satisfying of our everyday experiences, we should care about it much more than we do. And we do care about it a great deal today, but I want, want to suggest that's not only justifiable, but we should care about it even more. We have to eat several times a day. Why not enjoy it, not just as a passing pleasure, but as something that makes the everyday, the commonplace, extraordinary? I've talked about why aesthetics is important in modifying our social norms. Why is this, the aesthetics of everyday life so important from a personal point of view, for each one of us as individuals, from a kind of existential point of view? This famous quote from the film Fight Club provides the experiential background. Fight Club came out, I think, in 1999 or something. Um, and um, so I'm just going to quote from that film. There's a little bit of bad language in here if that offends anybody. I, I, Apologize in advance. Um, man, I see fight, in Fight Club the strongest and smartest men who have ever lived. I see all this potential and I see squandering. God damn it, an entire generation pumping gas, waiting tables, slaves with white collars. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. We're the middle children of history, man, no purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. And we're slowly learning that fact, and we're very, very pissed off. <laughs> That's from the Edward Norton character in Fight Club. Now, this could have been written by... Theodore Adorno, if that profound but difficult thinker had written in the language of the working class. Most Americans live lives that are highly regulated and standardized via networks of management and control, governed by the pursuit of efficiency and profit that crowd out any other value. And these values of the workplace increasingly colonize our home life, our private life as well, thanks to intrusive media technologies. We tend to work long hours at boring, repetitive jobs that demand our full attention in order to make someone else rich. And we evaluate our lives according to how well we conform to these norms. Efficiency is the only value. It's the only value anyone cares about. That is, if one's job is not outsourced to a machine, which, by the way, is increasingly likely. Everyone needs a way to resist these demands, a place in our lives where beauty uh, pleasure and a focus on things that have intrinsic value occupy our attention. By, the way, by intrinsic value, I, th I mean things that are valued in themselves, not because they produce something else. Their value is intrinsic to them. Finding extraordinary meaning in simple things and their particularity, such as a meal or a bottle of wine, is the most successful path to a good life in this damaged world. That ordinary things are the greatest source of meaning course, is not a new thought. Ancient sages from the Buddha to Epicurus had similar notions. But it is more relevant now than ever in an age where the pursuit of technical knowledge uh, and efficiency promises a systematic elimination of anything that does not conform to the demand for quantification and standardization. So one of the main arguments in my book, then, is that the culture of the table resists this world by rejecting the homogenization and speed up on which the larger economy depends. The focus on slow leisurely savoring, the slow food movement, uh, the use of fresh local ingredients, um, the, uh, the you know, farm to table movement, um, the interest in local flavors, uh, and the creative do-it-yourself ethos, the people that are butchering their own hogs and you know, fermenting their own sauerkraut and so on. Uh, all of this suggests that the culture of the table operates according to a different set of values where we put pleasure before production and care before commerce. The food revolution in the United States is responding to our need uh, for face-to-face, -face, authentic experiences, personal creative expression, and a sense of community, which we don't get, I think, in the larger culture. Of course, the character in Fight Club creates a place where men get together and beat each other up to feel better about their limited lives. Uh, I guess that's aesthetics of a sort. Uh, a sensory experience, no doubt. Um, but we can probably do better 
by seeking a form of everyday beauty not tainted by violence. Now, one might object that taste is both subjective and trivial. A preoccupation with such matters is useless without any larger significance. After all, no one cares about what I had for dinner except me. Although people do put lots of photos of what they had for dinner up online, so somebody seems to care about it. Right? Um, but the fact that taste is subjective and trivial is a feature, not a bug. Uh, for it is precisely the subjective and the trivial and taking delight in such matters that escapes the clutches of instrumental reason that resists the encroachments of a corporate mentality that translates everything of value into a commodity with a price and uses up every resource, both human and non-human, in order to line someone's pockets. In this, in this case, as in so many other parts of life, the personal is political. Despite being a personal matter, a concern for taste and quality is the first step in shaping our, uh, of our desires toward more sustainable forms. Such a commitment in the realm of food and beverage means we must refuse to accept what is false and, uh, and inauthentic, that we recognize and block the strategies of industrial food producers when they try to commodify our desires. When we outsource our practical reasoning to marketers, our desires are no, uh, are no longer our own. The only antidote to such outsourcing is critical thought, conceptual imagination, and a mind sufficiently open to fully appreciate the intrinsic value of what is before us, as food and drink almost always are. Philosophy can be, perhaps must be, enlisted in this attempt to keep the question of how one should live in focus, because philosophy has always sought to discover what is of intrinsic value. As Epicurus said, not what we have, but what we enjoy constitutes our abundance. If I had a glass, I'd say cheers. But <laughs> uh, questions? We have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, you said you um, addressed. Uh, there were um, objections to your to this idea that philosophy involves can be involved in this area? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what were some of those objections? Well, so the modern view, there's, there's, there's many such objections to this, this notion that, um, I mean, most philosophers today think of philosophy as a theoretical enterprise. And there's questions about how practical it is, right? And one of the reasons, and so I mean, there's a couple of reasons sort of off the top of my head. Uh, one is the view that uh, reason by itself doesn't motivate. That's a question about our motivational states and what's required uh, in order to get us to act to do something. Uh, and the fact you see something as rational to do, that you have good reasons to do it, is that sufficient to motivate you to do it? Now, the ancients thought, yes. You know, this is one of Socrates' arguments. Plato insisted on this, and so did the, the philosopher that came after him. It would suggest, you know, it would insist, the Stoics is, uh, as well, suggest that reason by itself can motivate. Okay, but a lot of philosophers, some philosophers would argue that today, but others would not. So that's just a controversial notion in philosophy. The second um, factor is that um, questions about happiness, again, this is controversial. But for many, many, many years, okay, centuries, the notion of what constitutes happiness has been considered by many people to be too subjective, not something that we can uh, really address objectively. Now, we can't object, uh, address objectively questions about uh, moral conduct because that involves other people and you know, social norms and so on. And we can talk about uh, what the proper treatment of others is from a more or less objective point of view, um, or at least an intersubjective point of view. Uh, but the questions about happiness have been considered by many, many uh, philosophers to be just too subjective to get a handle on. I mean, Kant thought this, and um, you know, his view kind of has really dominated philosophy. Now, that's not to say every philosopher agrees with that, but kind of the dominant trend in philosophy was not to consider these questions about what happiness is to be uh, purely objective matters. Okay? So I think those two factors um, prevent philosophy from really being uh, practical and having much to do with how you shape desires. Okay? Um, uh, and I think that you know, what I'm suggesting here is that we should look at things uh, a bit differently. Okay? Is that
Um, if I understand correctly, you're advocating us limiting uh, the production of food in order to increase the quality of locally grown produce. Is that correct? Am I on the right? Limit the production of? Well, the mass production. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it does, this is a complex question. It's not so much that you limit the production of industrial food, uh, but you try to reduce the demand for it when possible. Now, I don't think, uh, as I look at this literature, and there's a lot of um, discussion about this right now on people who study uh, food supplies and so on, um, I, I have come to the conclusion that we really can't feed our population, as large as our population is, not just in the United States, but worldwide. I don't think we can feed our population without industrial food. I mean, industrial food supply has been really good in lots of ways because we really have now, we really do have the capability of feeding everybody in the world. I mean, our distribution networks are not adequate, but we can produce enough to feed everybody at a relatively low cost. Okay? And that's the result of the uh, superior technologies and production practices of industrial food. So I'm not in favor of eliminating industrial food. Okay? Uh, lots of people don't live in areas where they can get fresh food all the time. We're, we're lucky here in California, but, you know, a lot of the rest of the country, many parts of the world, they have to ship food in. Okay? But you would like to see industries putting more thought and care into the aesthetics of the food to make it look better, to make it actually more nutritious? Well, I think that industries have to um, respond to their customers. And I want, cust I want individuals to think more clearly about food and the aesthetics of food and so on. And when the food industry produces stuff that's not good, doesn't taste good, is not good for us, we just don't buy it. Right. And I think, you know, again, I, I think that that sense of community uh, that uh, kind of emerges around, you know, farmers markets and knowing who your producer is and so that, I think that sense of community, knowing the people that cook your food, um, you know, patronizing local restaurants, the neighborhood bistro and so on. I think mean, all that's important, okay? Uh, and that, that should, we should make that part of our everyday life. Uh, now that is going to, you know, um, limit our participation in chain restaurants and, and so on. And I think we should. Uh, now, I don't think we should outlaw them. Uh, they have a place. But they shouldn't dominate our approach to food. They shouldn't control our approach to food. We should control it. Yeah. From what I can tell, no one has shown that genetically modified food is harmful to, uh, to our health. It doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, again, the jury's still out. We could discover something new. We certainly need to study this very carefully. But as I look at what scientists are saying, it's not obvious it's harmful to our health. Now, is it harmful to the environment? That's another question. Um, and you know, when they use gen genetically modified seeds and so on, you know, companies like Monsanto control it. There's a lot of problems with control over the, that industry. Of course, you've got to have high technology to produce it. And if your, uh, your genetically modified seeds are uh, making it difficult for other non-genetically modified seeds to exist because of environmental encroachment and so on, that's a problem. So we have to, you know, we have to look at that carefully. So I, you know, I'm kind of on the fence about it. I'm not entirely opposed to it. Because certainly uh, we're going to need, it looks like, given uh, the impact of climate change, we're going to need uh, produce that is, resist that is uh, able to survive in heat, that's resistant to, that uh, doesn't need as much water, that's resistant to certain kinds of diseases that are going to come up as the, as the, the uh, climate warms. And that's going to require genetic modification. So I'm a, a completely opposed to people who want to eliminate it. I mean, I think it's, that's crazy, right? But that's not to say there aren't issues there that we need to look at carefully. And to the extent that we can prevent Monsanto or any other company from gaining a monopoly on this. I mean, we need to make the technology widely available if it's beneficial to us. You know, so the, my objection to GMO is, has to do with the control by certain companies and the, the monopoly they have, rather than um, trying to eliminate the technology. With the food industry, there's very little competition, which is true of many, many industries. We just, you know, we don't really have a capitalist, a, a pure capitalist system here. We have a, a, an oligarchy, essentially, uh, you know with just a few firms that control uh, our food supply. On the other hand, my sense about trade agreements is they're a lot more about foreign policy than they are about trade. Um, 
I mean, I think that the general argument for trade agreements has been that uh, when countries trade with you, they don't want to fight with you so much. Um, and that it encourages dialogue and discourse rather than, uh, rather than warfare. Um, and I, I, I think there's something right about that. Um, you know, when you pull people into a trade relationship, then you've got a stake in each other's welfare. And that's a good thing. Um, and I think that's been part of the argument for trade agreements. So I think this is a very complex issue. It's being treated in a um, superficial soundbite way <laughs> in the presidential election. So I'm not terribly happy with how that discussion goes because I don't see enough careful analysis of it. I don't think it's a simple issue. Steve? Oh, um, as you know, I mean, I embrace the spirit of uh, your project. I think it's very important, you know, the aesthetics of food and the, if I can call it the existentialism of food, you know, being meaningful mm -hmm. and its totality, right? I mean, eating with people and having a sense of community. Um, I was impressed by your analysis of Foucault, but I'm wondering what he would say in his language, um, maybe you've already hinted towards, but if everything you say is right, which I think it mainly is, we're still up against a hell of a battle because of, I mean, fast food, cell phones. People don't even eat anymore with two hands. I mean, I observe people because I, you know, I've seen people doing this over, you know, linguine. For, and I, is she, is she going to go in or is he going to go in? I'm wondering how long they're going to text over. You know, it's getting cold. I, I even wanted to reach over and say, hey, that looks good. So, you know, cell phones, uh, people eat in the car. We have mass fast food compared to, let's say, the Mediterranean or other. I mean, Europe's not innocent, but I, mean, I think Spain is a leader in not going for fast food. But what would Foucault and what would you say about this battle we have? I mean, given that food is uh, precious, sacred, meaningful, and eating together and, and dining out and, and, and making food for others, that it seems like society is, that the totalitarian society that Foucault describes, it seems like it's winning. <laughs> well, yeah, there's always going to be this tension because I don't think, you know, we're, and I'm not, certainly not arguing that we get rid of technology. Yeah. Right? Uh, but what I think we do have to do is find places in our lives, and these are very much like you say, existential decisions are about individual decisions each of us make uh, about the kind of life to live. Uh, and um, so each of us has to make these decisions for ourselves and hopefully through that, through a kind of grassroots movement, which the food culture is, right, um, create norms that are opposed to the, um, the, you know, the technocratic norms and so on that are simply being imposed on it. It doesn't mean you give up on technology, but you make technology conform to what you think happiness is, not what you know, the global corporations think happiness should be. Sure. Right? So you have to, so that requires this very discipline. For Foucault, this notion of care of the self is a very disciplined process where you, you, know, you analyze all the things that influence you and, and, and try to sort out whether um, they're imposing a norm on you, or whether that's something that um, uh, you're resistant to, you know. And then once you draw that conclusion, it takes discipline also to change your life, to change your desires, to reshape them. Um, so this was the whole thing is this very c complex practice that he's talking about, um, and um, it's something like what the Stoics were up to, except without the metaphysical baggage that you know, came with it, right? Um, so. You know, I, I do think it's a, ch it's a, certainly it's a challenge. Scott. But I, I often despair of convincing, even convincing my students that there are such things as uh, principles and standards of aesthetic tastes. There seems to be this kind of democratic leveling of um, taste that says uh, every opinion, every aesthetic opinion is equal. Um, uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinion thereon, and. Um, what, duties in the eye of the beholder, and uh, for for example, I can't even convince them that ACDC's vocals or vocalists are poor. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, I mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, uh, so I was wondering if you have any ideas on on how we might elevate their about their uh, you know uh, aesthetic tastes. Can you name yeah. Salton Scott? <laughs> 
this is, uh, yeah, this is a very difficult issue. And, um, um, yeah, because I said in the paper, I said that the subjectivity of food is a feature, not a bug. Because it is something each of us have to make our own decisions about. We all have different tastes. Nobody denies that, right? Um, you know, some people like one thing, some people like another. And it's kind of mysterious why that is, right? Um, so on the one hand, these are individual subjective decisions that we make. And that's a good thing. Because the fact they're subjective means that you can make them by yourself. You can make them on your own. You can decide for yourself what s style you're going to exhibit, OK? But I mean, I do think that we also need a critical discourse out there that has standards, OK? Um, and uh, it's important. Uh, and I think that's something we don't have in, the, in food culture right now. Almost anything goes. And you know, uh, criticism is what is on Yelp, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, and, the age of food criticism has kind of gone by the wayside because that used to take place in newspapers, and new newspapers have laid off all their food editors and so on. Um, so there isn't any place now where you get good food criticism or where there's an opportunity to develop critical standards for food. I think that's a problem. Same things happen with music. Same things happen with music. That's right. Uh, but even though you know uh, you could you could argue there's no critical standards for music either, there's still good music being produced, just like there's still good food being produced. So I think it, you know, uh, all of these things, there's a tension between the objective element and the subjective element. And to be quite honest, this is an issue I'm really concerned with right now, uh, trying to think through this. These terms, objective and subjective, they're not that useful. Because it seems like you're talking about something that's an extreme contrast, and it's, they're not. I mean, there are, on almost every phenomenon you want to talk about, there are objective components and there are subjective components. Uh, and what we need is a, a concept that does the work of showing how those two relate. The notion of intersubjectivity helps, but then you lose the connection with the object, right, that should be driving our, our discourse. So. Um, you know, this is a very deep philosophical issue about this relationship between objectivity and subjectivity and how we work through that. Okay? So um, you know, I, I think we, we need both a concern for our own tastes, one that resists the influence of the larger culture. Um, but at the same time, we do need some critical standards to help us sort through what's good, what ha what's a, a quality, and what isn't. Um, and um, we need a, a productive tension between those two. And that's about the best I can do on that topic at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really neat that you're coming at philosophy from like a social justice route, essentially. Um, my concern is that as food justice has kind of become more notable, it's made appearances most significantly with intersectionalities with um, class. Yeah. Um, my concern is that it takes a lot of privilege to be able to sit down at a table and talk about the aesthetics of food. Um, and I was wondering if you addressed that in your book at all, or if so, how? Yeah, I do address it to some degree. What I want to say about that is I, I think it's not true. I th first of all, I agree with you about what you say, the intersectionality of class mm -hmm. and so on. That's certainly true. And you know, if you want to, well, I talk a lot about food as art in the book, and if you want to really appreciate the highest examples of food as art, you got to have, you got to drop a lot of coin because uh, you know that doesn't come cheap. Uh, you, you know, it's, we're talking two, three hundred dollars for a tasting menu per person, okay, to taste the best, okay. But you know, I travel around the country a lot, and I, you know, I, most of the time I'm either drinking wine or eating food, okay, because um, that's what I enjoy about different geographical regions. And the most exciting thing I see is young people, mostly, okay, starting businesses, um, food businesses, or uh, coffee shops, or breweries, or what have you, okay, and developing their own take on things. Um, and you know, they're not rich. They don't have a lot of money. But they're really concerned with the aesthetics of food. They're concerned with their personal creativity and making sure that in that dimension of life, they're being creative. Um, now, it does take some resources, but I think as long as you, uh, uh, you know, even if you can only afford to buy, um, you know, relatively inexpensive food, okay, 
uh, you can still really enjoy what you have. So you can learn to appreciate food, even simple things. So I talked a little bit about simplicity in the, in the paper here. And um, I'm, I'm really interested in this notion of simplicity as an aesthetic concept. I don't think that's been talked about enough. Um, we usually talk about complexity uh, in aesthetics. And that seems to be opposed to simplicity. But I'm working on a paper right now to argue uh, against that. But uh, I do think that even if you can only afford relatively simple, simple food, you can really enjoy it, learn to enjoy it, learn to um, cook it well, uh, learn to make it well. Um, it does, the, what it does take, though, and again, this is a, a fundamental um, thread in the book, it takes time. Uh, and you know, food culture is about slowing down. It's about taking the time to savor. And that means taking the time to make it as well. Uh, there's, I think there's, there's no escaping that. If you're going to create good food, it does take time. It takes relationships. It takes relationships as well. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, so I, I don't think that this is just about you know, rich people you know, playing around with food. It looks like that sometimes. And that's what you get a lot in the media. But that's not what I see you know, at the sort of grassroots level. Uh, I just see a lot of you know, people interested in food, not a lot of money, kind of working on a shoestring budget doing really interesting things. You know, almost every little neighborhood bistro you go to today will have something on the menu that's just, wow, that looks different, interesting. I never had that before. Um, and uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think we should conceptualize this as a, um, something that requires uh, lots of resources, uh, aside from time. And I think it does require that. And relationships. Yeah. With respect to time, when do you think about, or have you seen any of the shows like Chopped or uh, Top Chef or um, what was that other one? Uh, the guy that yells sometimes. Hell's like, Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. Okay. Or yeah. Iron Chef or right. anything like that. What do I think about those? Well, because that the time is very limited and there's their ingredients are very limited right and their assignment is so to say is to produce something that looks good right. tastes good and uses all the yeah. ingredients yeah well i mean that's entertainment okay right <laughs> it's entertainment it's something that uh, uh actually i find chopped to be one of the most inspiring shows on tv okay uh because i've actually found that to be very useful in my life uh, the way I prefer to cook now is just look in the refrigerator, see what I have, and make up something. Uh, if your family has a high tolerance for failure, um, <laughs> that, that works OK. So um, you know, I, uh, there are concepts on those entertainment shows I think that are really interesting. Of course, the format is something that you know, we can't really adapt to our own lives very well. Okay? Uh, but you've got to remember, those people are trained. Most of them are trained. Uh, and they have spent a lot of time preparing. So even though it's, you know, they have a few minutes to, to cook something, they've spent years learning to do that. Okay? And I, you know, if you're going you're to make this a part of your life, you do have to invest the time and the effort into it. I think there's no way around that. Okay. As a follow-up, one of the um, people that was on Top Chef, uh, Brian Malarkey, opened up yes. several restaurants in San Diego. And I only got to visit two of them before they started to close down. Yes. And I'm saddened by that because each restaurant that I went to, were, they were very different mm -hmm. and very unique. And I, I don't kind of understand why. I mean, was it the economy? Do we want more Jack in the Box or do we want more, you know, Top Chef food? I think a number of things. Uh, first of all, a lot of his restaurants opened during the recession. He tried to open, and that was an awful time to try to open a restaurant. Um, hopefully, we're starting to come out of that, you know, uh, and uh, you know, we'll see how that affects the restaurants. But I think that had an enormous effect on the restaurant industry. Secondly, San Diego is conservative with their their tastes. Yeah. Um, people like traditional things here, um, and uh, aside from from Juniper and Ivy, which is a you know, fairly progressive restaurant, You're hard, it's hard to find uh, really cooking that's really innovative here. Uh, of course, that's another top chef, Richard Blaze. Uh, right, yes. Yeah, and that's a, a great restaurant. And that looks like it's successful. Um, uh, so I think San Diego is a bit conservative um, with, with their tastes. Uh, but I also think that uh, economics is always a problem, because it does take a lot of money to make 
this really, you know, food as art, it really takes a lot of money uh, to, to do it at the highest level that someone like Malarkey, you know, uh, might be trying to do. So, you know, new restaurants, you know, very hard to get off the ground. They're marginal business. Um, and there's so much competition with everybody sort of jumping into the market. Uh, there's just, uh, there always has been more failures than successes in the restaurant business. I mean, I think there, you know, to, it looks like to be successful right now, you need to, you need entrees in the 18 to 20 dollar range. If you get much higher than that, it's a very hard sell. Uh, you know, because people, you know, are not spending, you know, top dollar on food. Okay? So, uh, you know, I think uh, for celebrity chefs, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, even if you have the name like he does. I don't know exactly how to phrase this question without sounding somewhat antagonistic, but I think the net Go for it. <laughs> okay, well, with what you and the gentleman in front of you have been talking about with this local board movement and how the aesthetics of food is so important and how we should focus our attention on this rather than increasing productivity, increasing efficiency, ignoring the pursuit of profit, I get this feeling that the corporations who are supplying not just these fast food restaurants that we enjoy, but also the grocery chains, which most of us get our food from. I feel like they're getting unnecessarily a bad rap from this um, narrative that profit is somehow evil, and we should disregard money entirely for the sake of pr producing less food in general, and trying to focus all our energy to make it as good as we can, which to me sounds contradictory. Wouldn't a person want to increase the amount of money they can pour into their enterprise to make it the best possible it can be, and that includes food. Oh, I think if you're a business person, you're trying to, you, you know, one of the things you need to do is to make money to stay in business. I don't know that you have to maximize profits for shareholders, though. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not arguing that we should ignore efficiency, and I spend a lot of time talking about this in the book because there is a, a tension here. Obviously, efficiency is a value. Um, so is profit is a value. I mean, you can't operate a business without profit, right? So it's not that making profit is a bad thing inherently, uh, and it's not that efficiency is a bad thing inherently. The problem is that in our society, it seems to me, uh, nothing else has a value aside from profit and efficiency. Those norms uh, and I don't know, you may, you're much younger than I, have, uh, I am, so you, know, you might not have seen this, but I've seen a remarkable change in our culture over the past uh, you know, 50, 60 years in which more every year it's just efficiency and profit matter more and everything else gets crowded out. Everything else that matters just gets pushed to the side as something we you know, can't afford to uh, concern ourselves with. Yeah, I mean, so you know, there, there are serious problems with this kind of... Um, out of control, um, and again, I don't really want to use the word capitalism because I'm not sure what the alternative to capitalism is. You've got to realize there are different ways of organizing capitalism. A market is not some natural thing that has only one shape. You can make decisions about how you uh, structure a market, and the way we're structuring it right now I think is not a good thing uh, because it, um, it crowds out everything else of value in life. And so what I'm arguing is that we as individuals have to put that back in. We have to resist that. It doesn't mean getting rid of industrial food. As I said before, we can't feed the world you know, with using you know, local produce. It, it can't be done. Uh, I think that we need industrial food. But we don't, our value system doesn't have to be just that. And that's the problem. It it's seems to me that it's people. not sustainable. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's the sustainability issues that are you know, forcing this, okay, because we're going to run up against, uh, we've already run up against this issue of overproduction. It's going to continue. We simply produce too much, okay, and so we're going to have to uh, limit that production without, of course, limiting the quality of our lives, because who wants to do that? I mean, certainly nobody's, at least I'm not in favor of that. Some people talk like that sometimes, that we just have to do with less. I think we're going to have to do with less, but I want it to be of quality, because there's a difference between quality and quantity, a difference between you know, producing just to produce more uh, and producing something that is of genuine value, which gets back to Scott's point earlier about having standards and so on. I think it's important because we do have to come to understand what quality is. 
I mean, right now, uh, the, the, the food market is very interesting because there are a lot of innovative things going on, but some of it's really bizarre. You know, like sriracha smoked salmon or something, you know. Is that good? Uh, we <laughs> Well, can I, have a, can I ask a follow-up <coughs> sure. question? I, I guess a more down-to-earth kind of question would be asked. And from your perspective, do you believe that these mega chains care about the quality? Because from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you don't believe that they do care about quality. Well, they're constraints. I mean, they care about quality up to a point because they need to care about it enough to get their customers to come back. So they can't ignore quality, and especially service. I mean, they're very concerned about service because most of their customers care about service. Okay. Uh, do they care about quality? Well, yes, but not to the point they're going to sacrifice too much profit because they can. Given the structure of capitalism, they got to they got to please the shareholders. And that means they need short-term profits, so they just can't do what they would might otherwise like to do uh, in terms of quality. There are too many constraints to a you know a a, a chain restaurant or a, a, or other food company uh, in terms of what they can do for quality. They they do what they can when they can, but the constraints of uh, you know, showing a profit all the time and maximizing that profit means they, they have to limit it. Uh, so for instance, I mean, when you go to the supermarket, if you go into the, the section of the food where it's, it's uh, processed food, okay, uh, they spend an enormous amount of money uh, trying to understand the various chemical components of flavor uh, and trying to duplicate that to put in that processed food so that you will like it. Okay? Uh, and we know a lot about flavor now. We know a lot about the chemical precursors of flavor. Uh, we know um, the, what, 400 different chemicals in a tomato that creates tomato flavor. Okay? So you could, if you want, you know, create a cracker that tastes like a tomato. Okay? Um, and you'll probably find crackers that taste like tomatoes on the shelf. Do they taste like tomatoes? No. Because you can't afford to produce that cracker with all 400 of those flavor components. It's too expensive. So they have to cut corners. They have to do the best they can uh, under the constraints of showing a profit. And that means the quality is really not going to be there. So then you get really discouraged. This is a terrible cracker. You walk over to the vegetable section. And you try to buy a tomato. The tomato is not even really a it's tomato. It's like it's a, a green mass. <laughs> it's gas to look red. It was invented at UC Davis about 45 or 50 years ago. Right. It tastes yeah. like hell. It's it's yeah. But they're making money. They yeah. Yeah. So you know, uh, look. Um, again, you, you probably can't eat heirloom tomatoes all the time. You can't get them all the time. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to have to. You shouldn't, because if they came from all the way across the world just for a tomato, it's probably a bad investment. Oh, certainly, yeah. Moreover, the reason why those tomatoes are made like they, the reason why they taste like they do, so they is so they can be packaged and shipped they long distance. Last forever. That's right. Uh, now, a good tomato is not going to be like yeah. that. Okay, and you know we can't eat those good tomatoes all the time, but when you can, okay, try to make that part of your life. Uh, try to. Uh, shape your taste so that you're not just automatically going for that supermarket tomato that you're not going to be satisfied with if you're paying any attention at all. If you're paying attention to a tomato, you're not going to like that. Cantaloupes in San Diego in December don't make sense. Well, we can get fruit, almost fresh fruit, almost all, you know, there are certain times when... Yeah, but you go look at the label and they come from Chile or someplace they, like that. Yeah. And that does yeah. not make sense. Well, again, this is another complex issue because the, um, uh, sometimes it's cheaper to ship something in bulk 2,000 miles than it is to try to take it by truck down the freeway, you know, for 100 miles. Sure. This, this is complicated. So it's not the case that just because something comes from 2,000 miles away that it was... Um, that you're paying a lot of extra for that transportation it, because the ships contain, uh, can ship so much yes. in bulk. Right. It's sometimes cheaper to do that than it is to, to, uh, to use all the, the fuel and so on to truck it you know, in from uh, the next state over or something. So I mean, again, this is a very complex economic calculation about what's the most efficient um, uh, way of, of transporting food. Uh, it's not a simple issue. And again, for some people, they have no choice but to ship food in because they don't, they don't grow it there. You know, uh, hopefully our technology will get better 
so that we can allow people to grow food in uh, areas where they can't grow it right now. Um, you know, so some of those technologies are on the horizon. So I think technology is important. We have to develop technology. If you're going to have people developing it, they have to be able to make a profit. Okay? But what I'm advocating here is that it's not the only value. Okay? There are other values aside from efficiency and profit that we have to pay attention to because they're getting crowded out of our lives. Yeah. Um, yes, I, for one thing, I take it you're not in favor of soil and green. <laughs> Great movie. Yeah. That's an unforgettable movie. I've never forgotten that. It's sort of the, the extreme version. Of yeah. If you're not familiar with Soil and Green, everybody know what Soil and Green is? Uh, that was a film that came out in 1972. Oh, you, you really remember that? Yeah, Charlton like, Heston? Yeah, Charlton Heston. Right? Yeah. Um, and. You're going to have to give, give the plot away. Yeah, this is a. This is a uh, it's in the future. And it turns out. Okay, I'm, this is going to be a spoiler here because uh, it turns out uh, they're feeding these people these wafers, highly nutritious, okay, um, satisfying, and people, are, everybody in society is eating these wafers. Okay, turns out they're made out of human flesh. I wanted to get back to the uh, the connection between ethics and aesthetics uh -huh. um, because um, there's there's the focus on productivity and there's the focus on taste. And I also hear as a subtext in between, you're getting to uh, the person who, who cooks the meal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm curious if, if that is a substantial part of your book. Because if we're talking about not the chef in the restaurant, but the family cook, mm -hmm. the person who cooks the meals for the family, if it's a conscientious person, you've got the connection right there. You've got the ethics of uh, producing a meal that will be nutritious for the family plus will taste good, plus even a third element, because I'm thinking of my own family, of what my dad, who did the cooking mm -hmm. on an everyday basis, because my mom came home around 8 o'clock at night from work, uh, and uh, he wanted to make sure that it was nutritious, that it was, um, that it tasted good, which he was very, really good at, plus it had the comfort uh, element. Mm -hmm. And that's not just taste, taste that is the contrast to the, the the, the impersonal yeah. life that you That's live right. in your professional world, yeah. then coming back to the personal, to, to uh, creating some kind of content. Make yes. it interesting. Right. Make it different from yesterday. You don't serve the same thing two days in a row. Uh, having all those things, because as, as Jonathan mentioned, it's human relationships yeah. also, because you care about the family. That's right. Um, and there you've got the aesthetics, and there yeah. you've got the ethics yes. mm -hmm. combined. Yeah, one. That's right. Um, yeah, the whole. Uh, Second or third chapter is about that. Cool. Yeah, uh, taste is fundamental to civilization. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's you know, I, I explore the tension in the book between the home cook and the restaurant cook. They're not the same. Uh, certainly, in the aesthetics of each is quite different. Okay, uh, but you know, home cooking is a very important thing. It seems to me. And, and that is uh, to get back to what you were talking about. That is not class related. No, that's right. It's not class related. I mean, you know, even. Uh, people with not a lot of resources, they have to cook, uh, uh, you know, for themselves, and you know, it's something they do have some control over, at least if they have the time. Again, if you're working three jobs and you've got, you know, two or three kids and so on, it's hard to find the time. I mean, that to me is the constraint, the time constraint. You know, if you take, if you um, take enough time to sort of learn about nutrition, and learn about, and I don't mean going to, you know, to college to learn about it, but just take the time to learn what's out there about nutrition and so on. You can, uh, you can, there are cheap ingredients, things like beans, for instance, that are very inexpensive and very nutritious, and you know, you can do a lot with them. From a taste point of view, um, it does take some time to do it, and take some understanding about how to cook them, but... Um, in a pot. It's got, in, in a pot. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a pot, is that right? It does indeed. <laughs> you have to have some resources, granted. Okay? So I don't really, you know, I'm, I'm not conceptualizing this as a class thing. I think that, um, which is not to say that people who are not wealthy don't have other challenges, okay? especially time. Uh, I mean, if, you, you know, if, if you're in the management class, you can control your time. You know, if you're a college professor, you can control how you, you, know, how you spend your day. You have a lot of control over that. If you're working two or three jobs and so on, you don't have that control. Uh, and so that, that, that is a factor. But it's not just about money, it's about, it's about that time issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You mentioned in the lecture that sustainability was a driving motive of 
encouraging people to take time and to grow their own food, to consume their own food, to <coughs> cook it and all that, all of that. And going beyond like, just a classroom discussion of sustainability, I've heard from so many pundits, so many faceless talking heads that this sustainability is so important that we need laws in order to provide for sustainable agriculture, sustainable business. We need to, as you say, resist businesses who want to give us this processed stuff. People on the other end of the spectrum say we need to force these businesses to be sustainable, to force these individuals who are growing our food, and we need to force ourselves to be sustainable. And my, my question in regards to this is, how can sustainability be achieved at the point of a gun? Because that's where I see a lot of these discussions heading. Point of a gun? Do you mean well, the literally, or are you talking metaphorically? I'm talking the law. To, via law, I mean, metaphorically, the, the law is upheld at the point of a gun. Mm -hmm or some use of force, penalty. And I see a lot of discussions go this route where we should always, we should be like these communal enclaves that just sustain ourselves via our own local agriculture. And I think that's a very, I think that's a very primitive uh, viewpoint or a primitive solution to a very complex problem. I said it was a complex problem. And uh, you know, I'm not advocating that we all sort of withdraw these little communities and think that we can all be self-sufficient in these little communities. I, that's, I said earlier that's not on the table. But you, you, you mentioned another, I, I thought you were asking a question about regulation. About that's also another thing, like, how can people expect widespread sustainability? Because I think, I think we're good on sustainability, but that's on my own perspective. But if people want to achieve sustainability the way they think of it, how are they going to achieve it if they can't Force businesses to conform to it. Well, I think regulations are part of the picture. I mean, I think you regulate when you have to. Uh, it's not the preferred method. You, you prefer to give people incentives to act in ways that are sustainable without regulation. I mean, that would be the ideal. Um, but um, if you can't do that, then you have to uh, do regulations. But I mean, a lot of the uh, attempts to um, to create markets and sustainability uh, get shot down, like cap and trade, for instance. I mean, that's a market solution. I mean, you know, in economics, it's called an externality. I mean, the problem, you know, the problem we face in environmental issues from the very beginning is that uh, there are externalities that are not captured in the price that something is sold for. So if you, you know, it used to be the case that when you burned gasoline, when you sold gasoline and bought gasoline, okay, that was polluting the environment, but that cost of cleaning up the environment wasn't captured in the cost of the gas. Okay, now how do you do that? Well. Uh, you know, there, you can either directly regulate it, uh, or you can, you know, um, use something like cap and trade or something like that. I mean, there's various solutions to that. Uh, which one is best? Uh, I, you know, I'm not an expert on economics, so you know. Uh, so it seems to me you have different tools to use. One is not necessarily inherently better than another. It just depends on the context, which is going to work best. So you have to be pragmatic about it. Uh, but. I certainly don't see problems with regulations, reasonable regulations, when uh, you need those to get to properly incentivize people to do the right thing. I mean, it doesn't mean you're using the law, but of course. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to say, this is more of a comment, not really a question, but given the way that you advocate this sort of movement, the way that I, I because I've, I've been aware of it for several years now, the way that I've seen it grown. I think the best that people can expect of this movement is that it's going to be a locally, uh, it's going to be a local phenomenon. I don't really see like, you know, chain local <coughs> restaurants, you know, which sort of well, you can't. <laughs> right? that, that's, that's a very contradiction in terms. Of, right. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't see a lot of widespread success for this movement, simply because there are so many reasons for trading uh, interstate, internationally. Comparative advantages. I think there's so many uh, economic and even besides moral reasons why people should embrace increased production. Because you said overproduction was a problem, and not going off tangent, that's a discussion for another time. 
I don't think over. I don't think we are overproducing, but that's something else. Well, that has to do with sustainability issue, right? I mean, that's the that's the limit. And if you think that you know, if you think that standard sustainability isn't a problem, I suppose. I mean, then there isn't such a thing as overproduction at all, I suppose. If there's no issue of sustainability, why not produce as much as you can? And you really have to take a, a systems look, because you can. there's finite amount of water. You can irrigate in areas where, there's, where all the groundwater has been taken out. You can truck it in or whatever. You end up with salinity problems in the soil. The soil is sterile. But no longer can life be sustained there. And you, you know the problems keep cropping up and spreading, and so there's got to be limits. Yeah, I mean the water water problems are going to be increasingly really serious. Okay, that's pretty obvious if you live here. Absolutely. Yeah, it may well be. It may be the the, the problem of the next century. There are wars over water. Yeah. Um, and you know I don't don't know what the solution is, but that's certainly going to affect our agriculture. Isn't Carlsbad uh, online now? Is that going to help? The desalination, it? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it seems like it's that's also a, phenomenally expensive. Yeah, it's usually it's expensive. Incredibly yeah. expensive. Yeah. No. I mean, that technology is going to get better. Is that a solution? Well, we'll have to see if the technology gets good enough. Yeah. Most of the technology is better, but then over time. Over time, yeah. yeah. So, you know, hopefully that technology will continue to, uh, because we're certainly going to have enough seawater, given the melting of the... <laughs> of, and, then, of the and then look at, I think it's the LA Times today, in the business section, has on the front page an article about how much development there has to be in California <laughs> to prevent California housing prices from, from continuing to be unaffordable. Yeah. And it's like, you know, 30,000 houses a month have to be built in Los Angeles or the, yeah. or the you know, so that's that overproduction. Yeah, 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 I think we're overproducing all over the place. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, we're gonna keep seeing this, gonna, a problem's gonna get worse, okay? Now, you know, in the past, technology has solved those, sometimes those problems, we learn to produce things more efficiently and so on. And you can, I guess, just expect that to keep happening. But I don't know what argument you give to say, well, it always has to happen that way. I mean, that certainly happened with food, right? I mean, back in the 18th century, we had just very local food markets, very primitive technology and so on. And then we had the Green Revolution that just exploded, right? So through technology, we produced enough food where, in, in theory anyway, we, could, we can feed the world. So in that case, you know, technology worked to get us out of the, the scarcity problem, right? Um, is that going to continue? Well, it did once, <laughs> uh, but what's the argument that it will always has to continue? Um, so, you know, I'm sure technology is going to uh, 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 be a, a player here, going to be a factor. Um, and technological development requires resources and so on. Um, so, you know, I'm not opposed to technology. I'm not talk, talking about, you know, uh, some kind of uh, going back to living as we did in the 19th century. I mean, that's not on the table. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking about this in the, in the, in the book, the, the sort of contrast between the locavorism, which is, is sort of one approach, and then the food as art, you know, and modern cuisine and molecular gastronomy and all that, which is a completely different approach. And I'm arguing in the end, they, they're both about quality. And, um, and so in the end, this is focused on quality, I think, that, um, that matters. Key uh, is balance. Yeah, it's achievement of balance, yeah. Thanks, Thank you.